All right, well, for this morning, <clears throat> we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. I've already read other passages that have to do with um, uh, our responsibility to the government. Uh, here is a little bit more pointed, perhaps a little more full. And again, remembering that um, Paul here is not talking about absolute subjection to tyrannical government and just do whatever they say. Um, but we do need to remember that uh, we still have a responsibility to them uh, to do, uh, well, to submit to them, again, when they are exercising authority within the bounds of their God-given responsibility. Again, this is a, a huge subject, so we're only going to be able to just touch on it. But what I'm wanting to do is kind of cue us up or prime us for what it is we're going to be looking at this evening. So Romans 13, let me read for you verses 1 through 7. Paul writes, again, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For rulers are servants of God devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom taxes due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Well, again, may the Lord give us ears to hear what he has to tell us this morning. Now, last week we were reminded that God planned not only to save us, but to make us like his son. You know, we don't, we don't want to forget, of course, what we've seen from last week, and what we're going to see this week is going to be a part of this. But uh, remember that the Lord has chosen us and saved us, that Christ might be the firstborn among many who share His character. And I, and I, I want to emphasize that because there are many today who say that He has just he saved us just because He loves us and doesn't want us to perish. And really has no other plan than just simply to make us happy throughout all eternity. But while we're on earth, he really doesn't have much of a plan for us at all. And I can say that because I was schooled in a college that actually taught that. But he does have a plan, a plan to transform us, a plan to make us like Jesus and to do that while we're on the earth. Now, we have to think about what Jesus was like because that'll help us align with God's plan for us. When we read the Gospels, we see that Jesus walked in a very close communion, constant communion with his Father every moment of every day. That is, every desire, is every thought, is every word, everything he did was to love and honor the Father. Now, this is why the Lord gave us his Spirit, that he might create the same kind of love in our hearts so that we might begin to be, again, do what Jesus would do, that we might become more like Him, that we might live as He lived. Now, we also considered that in this process that the Lord has not only given us His Holy Spirit, but He's given us His Word and He's given us the other means of grace, means by which we can have communion uh, with Him. What we need to do, and again, it's not something that often happens automatically, but there is something we need to do. What we need to do is spend more time with God because the more time we spend with Him, the more we will be like Him. And we saw last week, that's the reason why He gave us the fourth commandment. He gave this, the fourth commandment gives us time. The Lord's Day, the Christian Sabbath, the first day of every 
week, our Lord calls us to set aside our work and our amusements and to spend uh, the entire day with, with Him. Uh, that's the purpose of the day. Remember last week we saw Puritan piety and how the Puritans were seeking to promote piety in the uh, British Empire. Uh, they realized that the Sabbath was very integral to this, and Dr. Godfrey pointed out that with the breakdown of the Sabbath in, in our culture, Bible knowledge and personal piety has, has really gone way down. Okay, time with God equals becoming more like Him. We need to spend time with Him. But we also saw that the Sabbath day is really just the beginning. It's meant to help us align our, our priorities with God's purposes for us so that we can spend the other six days of the week worshiping God by loving and serving Him in absolutely everything we do, even in the very choices of what we eat and drink. You know, everything we do is to be done for the glory of God. And, of course, what we're going to see this morning is that um, everything that uh, the, the government does, everything really the family does, everything that's done in the church, everything is to be to God's glory. Now, as I've said, we're going to focus on one of these things that the Lord would have us to do to worship Him. Worship is not just what we're doing here, but worship is serving the Lord and honoring Him in everything we do. Uh, so one of the things He would have us to do as a part of that totality of worship is to submit to the civil magistrate because this is one of the ways Jesus exercises His rule. Now, Paul begins in our passage by saying that every person, there's no exceptions, is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. In Paul's day, that would have been the Sanhedrin and Caesar. But throughout history, it would apply to a king, as we're going to see this evening, to a king in parliament, or perhaps both, or in our day, to a president, to Senate, Congress, you know, House of Representatives, and a Supreme Court, governors, mayors, and so forth. Now, we are to submit to them because, he says, there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Okay? God is the one who has ordained it. It's the administration of His rule over the world. God desires order. You know, the opposite of order is anarchy. Government provides the, this order. That's why God has established authority, as I mentioned before, in all three spheres of, of life. What, you know, we call the family, uh, the church, and government. Uh, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11.3 with regard to the family, and again, something that, uh, that I think a lot of... Um, people today don't want to hear, you know, because they reject authority. Uh, I think that was especially prominent, wasn't it, in the 60s and 70s of counterculture uh, movements and so forth. But Paul writes this, he says, but I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. And he also says in Ephesians 6, 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. So, he set up authority in the family. Now, he's done the same thing in the church. And the author to the Hebrews writes this in Hebrews 13, verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. And in the state, as we've just read in our passage. Now, let me just say this, God intends authority as a blessing, that those who have it are not to use it to tyrannize, they're not to use it to enslave, but rather they are to use it to serve and to be a blessing, to protect and to care for and to minister to those under their authority. Jesus is the example of this, isn't He? Because Jesus is the one who is the Lord. He is the authority. He may not have been exalted over all the kings of the earth in his state of humiliation, but he was the master over his disciples. And how did the master use his authority? Well, he used it to minister to his disciples, to teach them, to protect them, 
even to serve them. And think about how the Lord uses his authority even now in heaven that he is exalted over all kings and all lords. He uses that authority to serve us. Okay? His example, that is what he intends for us to do with any authority that he has given to us. And of course, it's not difficult to submit to authority when that authority is being used for our good, when it's being used to, to minister to us. All right, now secondly, because God has ordained this authority, and again, because of its, of its purpose, um, if we refuse to submit to it, Paul says, we're refusing to submit to God. Verse 2, therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. He goes on to say that if we resist it, there will be consequences. And they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. And Paul means by condemnation here, not damnation, but what he means is judgment. There will be punishment. And we'll, we'll see what that is a little bit further in the text. But then Paul gives the reason for why we should submit to it and the reason why there will be punishment if we do not. And, and this is very key and perhaps a little bit confusing at the same time, verses 3 and 4. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same, for it is a minister of God to you for good. Now, like I said, that, that can be very confusing, because not every government that, that I'm aware of rewards good and, and punishes evil. I mean, would you say that that was true of, of Nazi Germany or Stalinist Russia or even modern-day Russia or modern-day China or even our uh, country? I mean, consider our country, how Christians are being persecuted for doing the right thing. Now, thankfully, a lot of them are being exonerated now by the Supreme Court that they're doing things within their, their rights, but I mean, they have been persecuted for not making wedding cakes for same-sex couples that are getting married or standing out in a life chain. You know, people might curse at you for doing something like that. And the government gets upset over the pro-life movement. So I don't think Paul is telling us here in this text what the government will do. I mean, what every government will, will do that's been instituted by God. But what he's, I think, telling us is what they ought to do what God has ordained them to do. I mean, sadly, governors, kings, leaders are sinners, and they do abuse their power. Now, that they should reward good and punish evil also tells us that there is an implied standard by which they should be governing, okay? Not by the world's definition of what is good and what is evil, but rather by God's definition, what God says in the Ten Commandments. Have you ever heard of the book, By What Standard, by uh, um, um, Bonson, Greg Bonson? He, he's basically arguing in this book that there has to be a standard of right and wrong. And that standard can't be what man imagines, I mean, because what they imagine is dishonoring to the Lord. It has to be what, what the Lord says. And he gives us, again, a summary of that in the Ten Commandments commandments. Now, you know, it's interesting, Spurgeon, you know, Charles Spurgeon is um, one of the most um, well-known preachers in, in church history and well-known for his preaching of grace and God's love and his mercy and a wonderful illustrator. But Spurgeon has some pretty strong things to say about what government should do and how they should govern. And it's interesting, this, this quote is actually in your bulletin. I don't know if you read those quotes, but I, I do try most of the time to align them with the subject. But the one that starts, let's see, it's the, uh, the next to the last one. He says, I often hear it said, do not bring religion into politics. This is precisely where it ought to be brought and set there in the face of all men as on a candlestick. I would have the cabinet and the members of parliament do the work of the nation as before the Lord. And I would have the nation either in making war or peace, consider the matter by the light of righteousness. We have had enough of clever men without consciences. 
Let us now see what honest, God-fearing men will do. I don't know about the context of this. Maybe they had just gotten some good uh, leadership in there. But there's a debate even as to how governors should govern. You know, should they use God's standard of right and wrong or should they use some other standard? Well, Spurgeon at least believed that it should be God's standard. And I think when Paul says that they should reward good and punish evil, there has to be an implied standard of good and evil. It has to be the right one. Otherwise, they can't do that. Now, if that's true, we do need to ask the question, how, how can they ex be expected to do this when many of the rulers of the earth have never read the Ten Commandments? Um, well, it's because, I think you know the answer to this question, it's because everyone has an innate understanding of what God requires in their conscience. Conscience means with knowledge. That knowledge is innate knowledge that God gives to us by virtue of the fact that we're created in His image. It is a remnant, you might say, of leftover from our being created in the image of God that still remains. When we do what's wrong, we don't feel good about it. When we do what's right, we do feel good about it. Our conscience is teaching us. This is what we call natural law. Natural law is fallen man's understanding of what God requires in the Ten Commandments, the law written on the heart. Many commentators believe that's what Paul is referring to in Romans chapter 2, verses 14 through 15, when he writes this, For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these, not having the law, are a law to themselves in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. This is where we get what's called the moral argument for God's existence, the fact that there's this universal morality in the world. People who have never been taught by God's law know the difference between right and wrong. And Paul refers to it again in uh, chapter 1, verse 32, where after he lists all the evil things that men do, he says, although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. How do they know that those who do these things are worthy of death? And in the context, he's talking about all mankind. Well, again, it's because of this innate law written on the hearts of all mankind. That's why there's any immorality, or excuse me, any morality in those countries that have never had any direct Christian influence. Now, those authorities, those powers that abuse that standard are one day going to have to answer to God for that, aren't they? And that's why we need to pray for them so that we might be able to live a peaceful life in all godliness and dignity. We also need to pray for them so that they'll be able to give a good account on the day of judgment. So we should think about that when we're offering our prayers up to the Lord. Pray for our leaders. Okay. Now, thirdly, God has given rulers the means to enforce this authority. Paul writes in verse 4, But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. It is a minister of God, an avenger, that, who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. So how can the magistrate ensure that the one who does evil, actually, that he can punish that one, or how can he prevent it? Okay. Well, it's because God gives the magistrate authority to punish justly, right? That's why they can raise and maintain a police force and why the police can use force okay, in enforcing the law. That's why government can execute criminals for capital crimes. That's why they can raise an army to protect us as a country because they have the power of the sword. Now, this power of the sword is not simply meant to execute, but it's meant to strike fear into the hearts of those who are thinking about doing evil so that they won't do it, so that it will restrain them. The problem is that our government is not willing to use the sword anymore in, in, in all these different areas. Um, you know, police are, are afraid to stop someone with lethal force if they're threatening them because they're afraid of what might happen to them afterwards. Uh, 
justice takes too long. Uh, swift justice is what is necessary. If, if capital crimes were actually punished with, with capital punishment, it would make people afraid of, of committing those crimes but because they're not punished. They, they just have this license to, to do these crimes. And even on a, um, a, a national level, you know, why is it that, uh, well, of course, you know, there's probably different views on this, but why is it that Russia has attacked the Ukraine at the time that they did and not under Trump's administration when he was president? Well, I think they were afraid of what Trump might do if that, if that were to happen. But, you know, our present administration is, is really not quite so, um, you know, so hard, not, not using the sword, not, not threatening with the sword. Well, see, that sword is there for a reason. It's meant to protect. It's meant to strike fear. And the fact that it's not being used is the reason why people are encouraged to do evil. But government is God's avenger. It's supposed to be God's avenger, the one who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. That's what they're supposed to do. By the way, that's one of the reasons Paul tells us that we need to submit to it and not go against it because if we do, then not only can they punish us, but he says, for conscience sake, because we are going against God who is appointed these as ministers of his justice. By the way, that is also the reason Paul gives in Romans chapter 12, verse 19, which, which comes just, just before this passage. It's the reason why he gives us not to seek our own revenge. You know, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, that's not supposed to be for personal vendettas, personal revenge. That's supposed to be for the government to punish. God has entrusted them with the power to punish, not us. And so if we need some injury redressed, we need to go to God's avenger, okay, and, and not take revenge ourselves. We need, as he says, to leave room for God's wrath. And the way we do that is by letting the government do its work. Now, fourthly, because government authorities work for God, God calls us to support them. He says in verse 6, for because of this, you also pay taxes for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. You know, this, this used to trouble me as I was growing up and beginning to learn about paying taxes. Why, why doesn't the government just raise their own money? You know, why, don't, why don't they produce something and sell it? And, and, you know, well, the fact is that's not what government does. You know, they, they don't produce anything. They don't sell anything. But rather, their work, the work they do, ensures our safety, our protection, so that we can produce, we can work, we can sell, and we can keep our profits, okay? Their work allows us to be enriched. And because we benefit from their work, God commands us to support them. He says in verse 7, render to all what is due them. Tax to whom taxes due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Tax, the word tax there means tribute levied on persons and estates. Custom is the tax levied on goods and merchandise, imports and exports. Fear is the reverence we owe our rulers because of their power to punish. And honor is the respect we owe to their office. Okay. So this, in a nutshell, is what God requires. Okay. This, this is the command. This is what government's for. This is what we are to submit to. This is why. This is why we're we are to support it. So finally, let's consider a few uh, a few questions about if the government, you know, maybe isn't doing the right thing. Okay, what what are we supposed to do in cases like that? All right. So the first question is, does this mean, as Paul telling us here, that we need to honor government officials who are wicked? Okay, now, if I were to ask you that question, I hope you would say, yes, okay, we do need to honor them. Jesus says, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, and part of what we owe him from these other passages that we've read is honor. Now, rulers may not personally be honorable, you know, they may not be worthy to receive this. They may be wicked people. In that case, we need to pray for them, you know, pray, because who ultimately 
you know, has the hearts of all rulers in his hands. God, he's the one who turns them whichever way he wills, okay? We need to pray that God would turn them in the right direction. But even if they're going the wrong direction, we still need to honor them for their office. Okay, then second question, secondly, does that mean we need to submit to them in absolutely everything when, let's say, the, the magistrate is evil? No. When the magistrate tells us to do something that God forbids or not to do something he commands, we have to obey God rather than men, don't we? I think that's absolutely clear. When the Sanhedrin, remember, told the apostles no longer to teach or preach in the name of Jesus, they said we must obey God rather than men. And they went out and continued to teach and preach. By the way, that applies to all three spheres of authority. No one has the authority to tell you to do anything against God's will. You must always obey God rather than man. Now, thirdly, and here's the, the million-dollar question, may we overthrow a government if it becomes too corrupt? Th that's, you see, question, the question that's often raised about the Revolutionary War. You know, that's how this nation <laughs> became a nation. Did we do something that was ungodly when, when that happened? Should the American colonies have declared independence from England? A another example for tonight's purpose what should we think about the English Civil War? I hope you're familiar with that because it's a very interesting time frame. Was Parliament right to declare war on King Charles I? Were they justified in executing the king for the crimes that he committed against the English people both before and during the wars? Well, how do we answer a question like that? Well, here's how it has been answered. Samuel Rutherford in his book, Lex Rex, or the law is king, okay? The king isn't the law, but the law is king. He argues that kings are subject to the law, and they may be overthrown if they violate their God-given mandate. Interesting, isn't it? Because it sounds to me like Paul is saying that the governors or the, the ruling authorities should reward good and punish evil. Now, that means it has to be operating according to God's standard. If it's not, if it's tyrannical, then Rutherford is arguing it can be overthrown. But who can overthrow it? You see, here's, here's the real important question. Some might argue that anyone could just you know, raise up a rebellion and go against them, but not John Calvin. I don't think Rutherford would say this either. If rulers disregard the law of the land, okay, and the law of the land should align with God's law, King needs to uphold it. Parliament needs to uphold it. Our leaders in this nation need to uphold the law and stop disregarding it, okay? If they disregard the law of the land, if they tyrannize their subjects, they may be overthrown, Calvin argued, by another lawful authority, okay? Not just anyone, but someone who has authority, okay? That's why we're going to see this evening the Puritans favor decentralized government. Maybe that sounds familiar to you because uh, there was someone who, was, who actually sadly uh, passed away during the COVID epidemic, but somebody we're very familiar with, uh, Mike Winther, who, who argued that our, our founding fathers gave us a decentralized government. Um, you know, they, they divided the powers so that if one went astray, the other one could bring it back, you know, in, into uh, alignment with what it should be. That's what the Puritans favored. So that if one authority became tyrannical, the other could call it to account. And by the way, this may be why so many of the Puritans were Presbyterians. <laughs> you know, Presbyterianism, of, of all the church governments, has accountability. Um, it, it, it's sort of decentralized, you might say, in a certain way. There, there is uh, another body that can call someone who's getting out of line to account and get them back into line. That, that's a good thing because we all need accountability. As a matter of fact, as members of a congregation, uh, members of the body of Christ, we, we're actually supposed to encourage and hold each other accountable. Uh, husbands and wives hold each other accountable. Uh, because we are so, it's, you know, it's so easy for us to go astray, 
Okay. Well, Parliament was an authority. Yeah, they, there were the Lords, and there was the House of Commons, and the House of Commons, I understand, were elected to those positions by the people, but they were a representative government, but they were an authority. And they fought against Charles I because he was exercising an unlimited and tyrannical power over the rights of the people. He was not upholding the law. So if Rutherford's right, if Calvin's right, if Paul's right, okay, the law is king. That means God is king. Christ is king. This king is accountable to Christ. And if he's not obeying Christ, there has to be a power that can hold him accountable. And in this case, it was parliament. And parliament is an authority, isn't it? It's, it's a ruler. It's a governor. Now, what about in the case of the Revolutionary War? Okay, well, the Continental Congress made up of delegates from 12 of the 13 colonies. I thought 12 of the 13. Why didn't the, why wasn't it all 13? Well, it turns out that Georgia did not send a delegate because they were facing a war with their neighboring Native American tribes and they didn't want to jeopardize any help they might get from the British. So they decided not to send a delegate. But this Continental Congress, which were the representatives of the people, the authority in the colonies, Okay? They voted to declare their independence from England because they were being taxed heavily. And I understand that it's because the British had defended them from, you know, it was the French-American, uh, French-Indian wars. And that costs a lot of money. And so they were, you know, start trying to, re you know, regain that, uh, that revenue. But um, also I understand there was, well, I guess the taxation on their tea, right? The Boston Tea Party and that whole thing. But... Because of this heavy taxation, without having any say in how these taxes would be used, does this sound familiar? Okay. They declared independence from England, and when England attacked, they saw that as tyranny, and they defended themselves. Okay. So again, you have an authority fighting against another authority. By the way, this happens throughout, throughout history, doesn't it? I mean, think about the times that Israel was um, under the subjugation of a foreign king and they were being tyrannized by them. How did the Lord deliver them? He either raised up a king or he raised up a, a general like Joshua or he raised up judges that would mobilize the people and lead them against this tyrannical authority. If we were just simply to submit to any authority, as Paul is saying here, then they would have been wrong to, to prosecute war even against these foreign powers. Okay, so not every authority needs to be just obeyed without, without question. And there are situations in which, you know, we should, um, well, uh, resist and try to overthrow. But again, the question is, how would we do that? We're going to look at that in just a moment. Finally, the question is, um, should we pay taxes to our government when these taxes are being used outside of their God-given mandate? Because what is God's mandate for government? You know, that, that's another important question. Are they supposed to take the wealth of the United States and distribute it equally to everyone? Is it, is it supposed to be like a socialistic environment? The government is using that money, you know, on, I don't know what you say, on the, on the best possible scenario. They're, they're trying to help people by robbing from the rich and giving to the poor, or are they buying votes, you know? There's differing theories as to why they do what they do, but socialism, trying to make everybody equal. Um, should we pay if that's what's going on, if they're not just simply protecting life and liberty, which is their God-given mandate? Well, Paul doesn't mention any exception to the rule, does he, in this case? And Jesus said we are to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And that was a king who was perhaps prosecuting wars that he shouldn't be. Jesus even paid the poll tax for himself and for Peter, which neither of them owed, so that he wouldn't give offense. Well, that taxation was unjust in those days, but they were still called to pay those taxes. By the way, taxation today is unjust, perhaps even more so. But, and the taxes are being used for things that they shouldn't be used for, even as they were in those days but we still need to pay them. 
although take whatever breaks we can through the law, you know, when you, when you go to your, you know, tax, tax guy. Okay, but we should pay for them, but at the same time, we need to remember that we do have recourse. We have certain recourses that Paul didn't have, that, you know, the people of England perhaps didn't have, although they did through Parliament. Uh, and they did have one that we do have. Our first and most powerful tool that we should use for unjust, uh, unjust taxation and ungodly leaders telling us to do ungodly things is we should pray for them. Pray that God would move the hearts of our leaders in the right direction to do what is right. Pray that he might put down one leader and raise up another. I mean, what's this rod of iron that Christ wields during the time of his rule on earth except to put down one and to raise another? That might be referring to nations, but it can also refer to people. And we do need to be concerned because if God has destroyed nations before ours for their evil, like he did Rome and many others, he can do the same thing to us. We need to be praying for our leaders. Secondly, we do have avenues to address these things that, again, were unheard of in Paul's day. We can vote. You know, I mean, I don't think Caesars were voted in. We can lobby. We can petition. We can contact representatives. Sadly, that often does no good because the representatives already have their hearts set on a particular course of action. We can even run for office, okay? But we should use, we can also do rallies, right? But we should use these God-given ways to curb the evil of our government and bring things more into conformity to God's will. Some would argue that states can also hold the federal government accountable, and I think they should do that. You know, the South tried to do that in the time of the Civil War. That didn't work out terribly well. But it's still something that should be done, and I think that's the reason why our government was set up the way it was to begin with, was that there would be that accountability, states and federal government. But let's also remember that when we pay our taxes, okay, we're not responsible for how the government uses those taxes, are we? They're going to have to give an account to God. We just simply need to be faithful in what the Lord tells us to do in this regard so that we can give a good account. We need to pray for them that they might, but we need to realize for us to give a good account to the Lord, we still need to pay our taxes. We need to obey the law, okay? Um, that is what our Lord would, would have us to do. So, Again, as we think about this, let's, let's pray that God would give us the grace to be able to navigate through, you know, the, these differing things that we've just heard this morning. There is a real honor we need to give our government, but remember, they are limited. They cannot compel us to do anything contrary to God's will. And uh, that's, I think, the main thing we need to remember. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's... Um, Let's not only pray that God would give us wisdom in how to respond to this, but that he would prepare us also for uh, the, the table.